o período de mais crescimento, de mais distribuição de renda, de mais inclusão social na América Latina, aconteceu de 2000 a 2014, com a eleição de Kirchner, Lagos, Cristina, Lula, Sim. Evo Morales, Chávez, uhum. Rafael Correa, foi um momento de ouro da América Latina. Uhum. Agora você está vivendo um momento da extrema direita que estão fracassando de forma absurda. O Macri é um desastre na Argentina e ele é a solução. Ah, tem, uma, tem um livro... Porque isso está ah, acontecendo. Tem um, é... livro, tem um livro do Mia Couto, que é um grande, grande escritor moçambicano, hum. que tem uma frase que é o seguinte, em tempo, em tempo de terror, escolhemos monstros para nos proteger. Lula da Silva is currently the world's most prominent political prisoner. Leaked chat logs published by The Intercept have proven that the corruption charges that put him in prison were politically motivated. But how did Lula get such powerful political enemies? As Brazil's president from 2003 to 2010, he oversaw massive economic growth that brought tens of millions out of poverty. This success in the eyes of Brazil's elite was perceived as a threat to the social order and to their way of life. Lula himself understood this dynamic. É, ou seja, na América Latina, toda vez que apareceu um presidente que tentou fazer política social, ele foi derrubado. Todas as vezes. A, a elite brasileira e a elite de outros países não aceita uma política de desenvolvimento que tem inclusão social. Lula has seen this cycle play out before. Back in the early 1960s, Brazil was run by a social democrat who ushered in a series of left-wing reforms like the agrarian land reform and the nationalization of the privately owned oil refineries. The president himself was not a man with the left, but he was pushed thanks to vibrant social movements on the ground. In the early 60s, many in the student movement were radicalized by the Cuban Revolution and saw the country's hard left turn as something to emulate. The Brazilian elite were threatened by these reforms even if they came short of revolution. Rather than respect the democratically elected president's mandate, they instead chose to support a military coup. Their plan received assurance and backing from the United States. The US military dispatched an aircraft carrier off of Brazil's coast to establish a presence in the region and delivered weapons to Brazil's police for the purpose of riot control. The U.S. was prepared to assist Brazil's military if they could not enact a coup on their own. Declassified documents have revealed that the Marines had planned to send troops to São Paulo to finish the job if needed. The dictatorship immediately aligned with U.S. interests and severed diplomatic relations with the USSR and Cuba. The student movement survived the military's initial rise to power in 64 and continued to agitate and organize. In 1968, student movements exploded across the globe. Brazil was no exception to these uprisings. In the March of that year, a flurry of students hit the country, culminating in 100,000 people marching in the streets of Rio de Janeiro after a high school student was killed by the police during a demonstration. This upheaval got the attentions of the United States and the CIA. While the CIA did not see the students as an outright threat to the military junta, they did see the student movement as a source of instability in other countries that had spread to Brazil. The military dictatorship had to stabilize the situation, especially once public criticism had reached the halls of Brazil's Congress. Near the end of 1968, the military junta issued something called the Fifth Constitutional Act, which suspended all legislative bodies and gave the military the legal framework to purge its enemies. The student movement, as well as other social movements, largely went underground during the following decade. 
Meanwhile, Lula da Silva rose through the country's nascent union movement, actually managing to win some gains for workers in an incredibly hostile political environment. <laughs> this climate meant that the metal workers union avoided strikes for most of the 1970s. Throughout the decade to maintain legitimacy, certain aspects of democratic society were allowed to return in a limited fashion. Congress was brought back in 1970. The Fifth Institutional Act was repealed. Persons accused of political crimes could no longer be banished and the rights of political expression were restored. The next year, the Metal Workers Union, now helmed by Lula, seized this opportunity and went on strike for the first time since the dictatorship started 15 years earlier. During this struggle, Lula formed the Workers' Party, known in Brazil as PT. The PT's coalition was made up both of union workers, as well as academics, intellectuals, and members of the liberation theology movement. The intellectuals were the political descendants of the country's student movement. The dictatorship imprisoned Lula in 1980 because of his role in leading the strikes. This happened despite the regime's restored protections for political speech. During Lula's prison sentence, metal workers continued their strike and demanded the release of their leader. When Lula's mother died, he received a pass to attend her funeral. 2,000 workers met him at the cemetery, all chanting Lula Livre, or Free Lula. Lula was released from prison on May 20th the same day the strike ended. Lula's political work would now focus on building the Workers' Party as its president. In the early 1980s, inequality skyrocketed, leading to problems like widespread poverty, illiteracy, and malnutrition, in spite of massive GDP growth and economic development. In 1985, the military could no longer coerce politicians in Brazil's electoral college. That year, the electors decided to elevate an opposition coalition to the presidency, and Brazil's dictatorship finally ended. Shortly thereafter, Lula himself would be elected to Brazil's Congress representing PT. A constitutional assembly began to draft the new constitution, which would eventually be enacted in 1988. It protected the right to strike, banned censorship of art and literature, land reforms were also proposed to combat inequality, but austerity measures to fight inflation caused by the dictatorship prevailed, hindering the advancement of Brazil's poorest citizens. In 1988, Lula made his first run for the presidency. Lula was able to survive until the election's final round, but he ultimately lost. Throughout the 1990s, Brazil's military and financial elite fought the country's political and economic reforms tooth and nail. Lula still could not win the presidency, despite strong showings in several elections. This changed in 2002. After an economic downturn, Brazil's voters were looking for something new, and Lula, after several previous attempts, made it to the election's second round. He would go on to win with a staggering number of votes, 52.7 million. Lula's landslide meant that Brazil's first left government in 40 years came in with a resounding mandate to deliver progress to the Brazilian people. Você tá lembrado qual foi a atitude que eu tomei quando eu ganhei as eleições? Claro. Você tá lembrado que eu coloquei todo o ministério num avião e levei todos os ministros para os quatro lugares mais pobres do Brasil? O que que eu queria com aquilo? Eu queria que um Meirelles, que era banqueiro, eu queria que um Palocci, que era médico, Eu queria que um Furlan, que era empresário, conhecesse uma palacita, que visse o homem e a mulher no mesmo lugar que eles defecavam, eles comiam. The administration prioritized combating hunger and poverty through its Bolsa Familia program. Employment and wages rose. Educational opportunities were radically expanded. Spending priorities were put into place to phase out hunger a goal that Lula would achieve in the second term of his presidency, and various other structural reforms which culminated in lifting 40 million people out of poverty. Brazil's elite saw these reforms as threats, and they were determined to put a stop to the PT. Nevertheless, they failed to beat Lula at the ballot box for his second time in 2006. 
Lula's second term, the economy boomed while living standards continued to rise for the Brazilian people. Under Lula's leadership, Brazil even managed to weather the 2008 economic crisis. Mas é fundamental que todos façam sua parte. É importante que os empresários sigam investindo. É imprescindível que os trabalhadores defendam a produção e o emprego. Já o setor financeiro deve trabalhar para estimular o crédito e baixar os juros que estão muito altos. He left office in 2010 with an over 80% approval rating. Lula's successor, former underground anti-dictatorship activist Dilma Rousseff, won the 2010 election. In February 2014, the Lava Jato investigation began. The state oil company Petrobras was implicated at the center of a massive corruption scandal. Dilma was accused of participating in the graft scheme, but no proof ever emerged. She managed to win re-election that fall, but plans to oust her were soon underway. She would be impeached in 2016 in dubious and illegitimate circumstances by a corrupted political process. The Lava Jato investigation claimed to be taking a sweeping look at structural corruption that had plagued Brazil's political system, but largely focused on the PT and Lula. Lula, intended to run for president again in 2018, was instead put in prison, unable to run in a race that all polls showed him leading. Lula's absence from the ballot allowed for J.R. Bolsonaro, a neo-fascist who praised the former dictatorship to rise to the presidency. Eu sou favorável à tortura, tu sabe disso. E o povo é favorável a isso também. Bolsonaro governs with the support of the country's elites as well as corporate elites, including the Wall Street Journal editorial page. But as government has already begun to falter, a new student movement has hit the streets to protest education reforms, and the Lavo Jato investigation that propelled him into office has been proven to be politically motivated thanks to leaks published by The Intercept. Lula himself is confident that Bolsonaro and other authoritarians around the world won't last for long and are doomed to fail like the military dictatorship before them. Eu quero saber quantos dias eles vão pensar que estão me prendendo e quanto mais dias eles me deixarem lá, mais Lula vai nascer nesse país e mais gente vai querer brigar nesse país porque a democracia, a democracia não tem limite, não tem hora para a gente brigar. Por isso que eu estou fazendo uma coisa muito consciente mas muito consciente. Eu falei para os companheiros, se dependesse da minha vontade, eu não iria, mas eu vou. Eu vou porque eles vão dizer a partir da manhã que o Lula está foragido, que o Lula está escondido. Não, eu não estou escondido. Eu vou lá na barba deles, para eles saberem que eu não tenho medo, para eles saberem que eu não vou correr, e para eles saberem que eu vou provar a minha inocência. Eu vou terminar com uma frase que eu peguei em 1982 numa menina de 10 anos em Cacantuva, que eu não sei quem é. E essa frase não tem autor. A frase dizia, os poderosos podem matar uma, duas ou três rosas, mas jamais conseguirão deter a chegada da primavera e a nossa luta é em busca da primavera.